قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر رأيتهم لي ساجدين. Sometimes you see a movie, right? And at the beginning of the movie, what do you see? You see this guy running, 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 running. All of a sudden, there's you see that he has a scar on his face, right? And you see this flash. And it's, it's one of those uh, you know, lights that come from the police officers. And he's running, and then you hear the sirens, and you see some gunshots. And it's a very intense scene. And then the scene switches. Two people are having breakfast. <laughs> right? And you have no idea what has just happened. Who is this guy? Who is this guy that's just running across the screen with a scar face? I know he looks pretty ugly. Why are you, the people are shooting at him? And so we don't know, right from the very beginning of Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, with Qala Yusuf, the Abi, Ya Abati, inni ra'aytu a'ad ashra kawkama, wa shamsa wa qamara ra'aytuhum li sajideen. He said, oh my father, indeed I saw in a dream 11 stars. And the sun and the moon prostrating to me, so subhanAllah, right from the very beginning, you're like, whoa, what happened? What does this mean? Eleven stars, but just, you start reading it, then you start finding out about it. And then at the end, oh, I, now we know what that means, right? Now probably at the end of the movie, you go back to the beginning scene, oh, I understand who that guy was. Right, you come back to it. And so... If you think and reflect upon the story of Prophet Yusuf salam, you have everything. Subhanallah, you have jealousy. You have envy. You have a very merciful father. And you have, yeah, you have, of course, somebody who is very old. And you have someone who starts off being thrown into the world and he ends up in the palace as a slave, and then he becomes the most influential person in Egypt. Not only is he the most influential person in Egypt, in the whole area. Why? Because when, when the drought afflicts the whole area, people come from all over the place. He has done such a good job of taking care of the finances of Egypt, that during the hardest times, they have extra surplus of grains and food that other people from other areas are coming into buy. So look how much, how beneficial Prophet Yusuf was for Egypt. Very, very beneficial. And you also have you have everything. Every anyone, everyone can relate to it also. If you're a father, you can relate to it. If you're a mother, you can relate to it. If you are a slave, you can relate to it. If you're a king, you can relate to it. If you are a merchant, you can relate to it. If you're a thief, you can relate to it also, right? There's everything there. Everything is mentioned there. And so there are so many benefits that we can extract one verse after the next. Another intriguing aspect of the story of Prophet Yusuf that everybody loves is interpretation of dreams. Right? Who amongst us does not have dreams? And sometimes we see dreams and we look for interpretation. But who can interpret the dreams or not? Remember from the very beginning. And it's just the curiosity because everybody wants to know the future. Everyone wants to know the future. And so we learn from the story of Prophet Yusuf السلام, that there are dreams that are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That a pious person and some people are given the ability to interpret dreams. So how do you know if somebody can interpret dreams or not? How do you know that you can interpret dreams or not? How do you know? If you're able to interpret dreams or not. And, and so in the story of Prophet Yusuf, those things are also covered.
and dreams. And I can offer it Yeah, talk a little bit more about dreams. Like, do you see it? See already? I was like, man, I'm just mentioning you every single aspect of it. But you're like, that's because it's the most beautiful story ever told in the history of mankind. In Jin also. Right? This was revealed for the Jin also. You have to understand. And so that's why every single verse of it is so beautiful. And it's a miracle in itself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off with Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alif Lam Ra SubhanAllah Alif Lam Ra Of course there are different opinions amongst the scholars of what this actually means but some of the scholars have mentioned that Allah, Allah knows best what it means but some of the scholars have that's one of the opinions by the way Allah knows that we don't know what it means it's something that's a secret and of course we say Allah knows best with everything but some of the scholars have said this is a challenge for the Arabs a challenge for the Arabs how is it a challenge for the Arabs? in that these are the same letters the same exact letters that you use Alif, Lam, Ra and you have to understand every talk every speech Every article that is written, you have to get the reader's attention from the very beginning. You have to get the listener's attention from the very beginning. A good speaker will get your attention right off the bat. Right off the bat. He, he, he doesn't take long. Oh, today I'm going to be speaking about the story of Prophet. No. Right off the bat, you take something, you mention something that will attract people's attention right away. Why? Because believe it or not, people make a judgment. And they decide whether they want to listen to you or not in the first 20 seconds. You got 20 seconds to make that first impression. 20 seconds. So you know how sometimes you get up, everyone's the khatib, right? He gets up. And he's on the member, and everybody's listening, right? Or ready to listen. Immediately when he starts, believe it or not, at that moment, after 20 seconds, maybe 30% of the people, I'll just sleep today. Right? They've already decided to sleep. <laughs> or if they hear certain accents or this person, uh, uh, then he starts. Let me just count my, um, let me see my, my, my bag account. Let me see what I've got. Bills to pay. Uh, they've already decided whether they want to listen to you or not. You don't have time to start slow. And that's why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts Alif la min al Mal Ida zil zil When the earth convulses and it shakes, it's shaking. Right from the very beginning, it's very powerful. To get your attention right off the bat. So how does Alif Lam mean get your attention? Besides, let the reason. A-L-M. If I started A-L-M like that, what do you think would happen? Ooh, what happened to this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, with the Arabs, when, when it comes to linguistics, when it came to, to language, fasaha, eloquence, that was something that they loved. It was a part of their life. It was so important to them that they had fairs for it. Like, you know, nowadays, what's something that's really, that people really like? They like gadgets, right? So what do they have? Like, you know, Las Vegas, every single year, what do they have? What's that, what's that called, the gadget fair? Consumer electronic show, right? Something like that. But all the new gadgets, that's what they used to have for poetry. And so every society that respects something and loves something, they will have fairs for. So they have fairs for, 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 for poetry, for eloquence. And so they get together in these areas. In fact, you know Badr? Badr was an area where they gathered together a fair also. 
That's why there are a lot of wells there. And then people, there are not, pe there are not a lot of people who live there, but they would come together. And of course, there's uh, other markets in other areas that are bigger than that, that, that the Arabs would get together. Uh, they would buy and sell, and they would also, uh, the show that they would have was, was the, the eloquence of, of poetry. And the winning, the prize poems would be called the Mu'allaqat, would be hung in, um, in the Kaaba. So, so that was a prize thing. They would, they would, uh, and people would memorize them. People would memorize them. So, that's what they were proud of. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single time. At the beginning of these surahs, he's mentioning these letters because he's challenging them that you yourselves are using these letters. But can you put together something like the Quran with these same letters that you have? These words that you yourself use. This is Arabic. It's an Arabic Qur'an. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right away, Alif Lam Ra, Tilka Ayatul Kitab al This is a book. In, 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 it, in it, it's ayat. These are miracles. Every single verse is a miracle. I remember, you know, before I did not understand Arabic. I had to learn Arabic. And I remember praying. This is the first time I started trying started really comprehending, studying Balagha, studying Nahu Sad, all of these things. And the Imam read was Shamsi wa Duha. Immediately the first thing that came to my mind, SubhanAllah, how beautiful is this? It cannot be, it cannot be made up by, no, no, human can put together words like this, so beautifully, with so, with such eloquence and full of meaning, it's not just like, you know, um, what is this, uh, black and blue and I love you and all kinds of things like that, you know. That doesn't make any sense, but it rhymes, right? It might sound nice, but it has no meaning. But here everything is put together, so I'm thinking, SubhanAllah. And that's why I love Bible, that's why I love to teach Arabic, because I wish everyone could experience that. And sometimes we don't realize that you know, even though you know you might know Arabic, but you don't know the classical Arabic, it doesn't sometimes have the same effect. So you might use some words that are in the Quran in our daily life, but it does not have the same connotation. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you are going to be in war off, you're going to be in war off, Allah mentions also the people, he never says Hujra. Why? Because there's a difference. When you have a house, the top room is a wolf and the bottom is a So you're not going to be in Jannah in the lower floor. You got the presidential suite, guys. Presidential suite overlooking the rivers, the trees. You got the presidential suite, the wolf, not in the bottom. And that's why, if you know the little and little bit difference, it's so much more beautiful. And so this. The way that the story of Prophet Yusuf salam, is mentioned is in itself a miracle. The beauty of it, everything, every part of it, that it's full of lessons. It's speaking about women, how they gossip, and it's speaking about the society, and also how to solve And if you're living in a non-Muslim country, believe it or not, it is for us. Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, we might say, well, you know, we're surrounded by non-Muslims. Uh, it's difficult for us. How can we be patient? Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam was a Muslim in Egypt, which is a non-Muslim land. And he was able to be firm and strong in all the trials and tribulations that he had to go through. This surah was revealed during the hardest years the most difficult time for the Prophet It was after the death of Khadija radiallahu anha, who was his support whenever he would find any, whenever he would face any problems outside the house, he, would, he could always depend on the support inside his house. 
The comfort was always going to be there. But then that was also gone. And then his uncle also who protected him, who helped him so much, he also passed away that year. And the people rejected him. He did not know where to go and he went to Ba'ath. And they rejected him also. They stoned him to the point where his feet were swollen and blood and, and his, his shoe or his hoof were filled with blood. And he did not know where to turn to call others to this deed. And so it was the most difficult time. And part of the Quran, one of the reasons for the revelation of this surah is to console the Messenger of Allah sallallahu in patience. To console him. So it was to console the Prophet sallallahu to keep him strong also, to be to remind him that others before him had faced the great difficulties. And indeed he faced very great difficulties, as Allah, the Prophet sallallahu said, أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءً الْأَنْبِيَاءَ ثُمَّ الْأَنْبَرُ وَالْأَمْثَرُ Those who are tried and tested the most are the Prophets. And then those who follow in their footsteps, in their ways. They are the ones who are tried the most. Why? You might say. Why? We might say. They were the best. Why were they tried the most? So that they can be examples for us in patience so that whatever we will go through whatever we go through we know that they have gone through much more difficult times than we did why can't we be patient so that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam can be the leader of those who are patient so that prophet yusuf alaihi salam can be the leaders of those who are patient an example for us to console us in our difficulties. And that's why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one day he came in and he said, he saw his wife, sorry, his wife Aisha radiallahu anh, she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, wa ra'sah, oh my head, my head hurts. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these were in his final days. He said, Bali Aisha, wa ra'sah, nay Aisha, my head hurts. Then he told her, he said, we, the prophets, <coughs> do not feel pain like one of you. Our pain is multiplied. And that's why the Messenger of Allah وسلم, when he had his fever, when his fever increased, one of the companions, they touched, he touched him, and he said, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was so hot, I could not keep my hands on him. SubhanAllah. Imagine, he could not bear to keep his hands because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu was so hot. So how much pain do you think the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was going through in his final days? <clears throat> but you might say that's the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Why do we have to go through that? It is to console us. So the next time you feel a headache, you realize that, you know, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to go through much greater pain than we had. For that headache that he felt would never be felt by any one of us. So that we can console ourselves. Be patient and I'm going to follow the leader of those who are patient. And he's the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In patience. If you lost the child, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lost three Count them three sons. Three sons. Anybody know who they were? Ibrahim, of course. Qasim, Abdullah, mashallah. Three sons in childhood. In, in, when they were very, very young. You know that? You know how difficult it is to take? One, two, three. So much so that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever has three children and they pass away and he's patient, they will have what? They will have Jannah. They will have paradise if they're patient. A companion said, Oh Messenger of Allah, how about two? How about two? The Prophet said, Even two. 
Everyone else who was there? And if we were there, what would you say? How about one? Anybody know why the prophets, why the companions did not ask? How about one? Do you, do you guys know the reason? And wouldn't it be obvious, like, if I was, I'd be itching to ask, right? Like, I'm, how about one, right? <laughs> wouldn't you be itching to ask, how about one? Also, why do you have to stop at two? Come on! Right? Wouldn't you be? I would. Now, why didn't they ask? Yes, they were shy, but they had manners. They had manners. And that's why when you read the hadith, you will always find the companions asking one, two, three, then they stop. Unless he gave the same answer. Like, for example, the hadith of the Prophet, so when the companions ask, when haqqul nas bi Right? That who, who has more right for my good companionship? He said, your mother. They said, who next? Your mother. Who next? Your mother. They would have stopped. They would never have got another question after three. Because they had manners. Why did they go? And why did they add another? Because it was the same answer. Just one more, please. Right? Just one more. And so then they said, then who next? Your father. Right? Your father. Now, then they just stop. Now for us, we were saying, who next? <laughs> who next? We got, when, is, when does this stop? But they had manners. That's why they did not go further. And by the way, this hadith, subhanahu, this hadith is, a, is such a great hadith. And that the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Messenger of Allah also mentions this to show the importance of the status of woman, of woman, of the mother. You know the mother, motherhood, is the career that all careers support. Uh, any career, any job that you have, it's to support them. Because they take care of, they take care of half, of, of, of the, half the ummah, and they are half the ummah themselves. <laughs> that's why they are the ummah. <laughs> so that's why, <coughs> A mother. That's why the Prophet ﷺ gave her, if this was an Olympic race, the mother would have gotten the gold, the silver, and the bronze. And the father would have gone home crying. Do <laughs> <laughs> you see? You see how important? But to get back to this, but patience. Of, of, of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoled the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa by revealing the surah and that the Prophet lost, he himself lost three and I'm going to continue how about one? will you get jannah? well you know you have manners with other people, you know the, the, the companions but they all had manners but there is somebody who has a special place who is with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa more than others who was who heard this hadith and was curious. And she asked, how about one? But not in front of the others, because the others who were there, they said, if we were to ask, how about one? If we were to ask, he would say, we'd have said yes. But we have confirmation of it in the hadith from Muslim Imam Ahmed from Aisha radiallahu anha, and she said, oh, of course, she has more leeway. She has this, you know, she's with the Prophet sallallahu all the time. You know, it's like, hey, you know, the other people are embarrassed. You're my husband. <laughs> Right? This is her husband. Of course, she has special privileges. So she says, how about one? And then the Prophet said, even one. But Aisha Rabbi Allah took it another step further to benefit us also. Because she herself, did she have any children? She didn't have any children. And there are many people who don't have the children, have, have children. Or their children don't, didn't die in, in, in infancy or when they, before reaching puberty. So, he said, so she said, how about those people? And so what did the Prophet say? This is for all of us. He said, Ana faratu man la farat ala. He said, I am that farat. For those who don't have it. Meaning, if you're patient because of the death of the Prophet then you love him so much. You know how when your child dies, 
You loved them so much, you were just waiting to be with them in the hereafter. You have that love, that yearning. So if you have that same yearning to be with the Prophet وسلم, also to the point where you're thinking about being with him in Jannah, أَنَا فَرَطُ مَنْ لَا فَرَطَ لَا I am that farat. For the one who doesn't have that farat, who doesn't have this privilege. And of course, we don't ask, we never ask for, or don't ever, 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 ever ask for problems. Okay, okay I don't have that. I want my children, I want to give birth and my, ch my child dies. No, 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 no. Right? It's Allah al -Afiyah. Always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you will be free from all calamities. My Allah wa ma baqan. All calamities, apparent and inner, outer. All the calamities, always ask. But if you're afflicted by something, then be firm. Don't look to meet the enemy. But if you meet them, then be firm. You know, some people I'm speaking to the, about the Dajjal, they go, Yeah, the Dajjal comes, and I'm going to yeah, show him who I am. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Don't ever ask for problems. Don't ever ask for problems. But if it comes, then be firm. And be strong. And I know it's time is running out. And I don't want to ruin my reputation here in the, this area also. I have a bad reputation in Seattle. They say, they have a say, they say, never give a woman a telephone or a stack of your body a microphone. <laughs> yes, they run. Never, right? It just keeps on going. So I don't, want to, I, don't want to, I don't want that reputation to follow me. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us from what He has taught us and teaches that which benefits us. And so, uh, this is just a glimpse. I mean, you can, we can only, we can't even cover one, we didn't even cover one night, one verse. Surah Yusuf is a very beautiful, the whole Quran is very beautiful. But Surah Yusuf, specifically Surah Yusuf, is a surah that everybody likes. Everybody loves. Why? Because everyone loves stories. Now, who doesn't like stories, right? And stories are one of the best methods and ways to get a point across. And to remind others, you remind them. So you, let's say you have a brother or a sister or an aunt or someone in your family that doesn't pray. If you keep on telling, hey, brother, get up and pray, get up and pray. And sooner or later, I said, just leave me alone. And he might come to the point, I don't care. Because he's so angry, so mad he wants to sleep for him, you know, I, I don't care. And because you feel like you're nagging all the time. Okay, okay, I know, I know, I know. So you're back, right? So how do you take care of people like that? You guys want to know? This is how you do it. Tell them stories related to that. They won't even feel it, but they'll be reminded. And they can't argue with you. Because you're saying, you know, if you're telling them to do something, they'll, make, they'll always think, when they don't want to listen to you, they'll always find objections, like, they're not even listening to you, okay? They're not even listening to you. They're, as soon as you say a word, they're thinking about what to say after you pipe. Like, just, 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 you know, just, okay. So they're, so half the words that you're speaking, they're still thinking about objections to what you have just said. Rebuttals already, rebuttals are like, well, they have this rebuttal machine in their head, and it's just going off when they're speaking every time, right? And you just, as soon as you close your mouth, boom, 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 boom. Right? And you just ah, give up. Then you never listen. And then there's an argument start, right? So how do you make them not argue and not turn on that rebuttal machine? Give them a story. Because they can't argue with you. They can't say. You, if they start speaking, hey, that's my story, brother. <laughs> Let me finish this story. You got the point across without them turning on that rebuttal machine. And then, and then when they are about to wake up, they'll listen to the story. And... I don't know, I have one. Can I tell them? Well, I promise you guys. You see the problem I have? You see? <laughs> Just one more, okay? Just one more. Okay, this is the final one, I promise. Yeah, I promise. Okay. No, I promise before, already. I know, but bear with me this one. Okay, so. Inshallah, this will benefit also all of us here, the parents and so forth, who are trying to teach our children. I used to teach in Cambodia. After I graduated from. Uh, Islam University of Medina. I went to Medina. We opened up uh, schools, a uh, couple of schools. And I was teaching the middle schoolers. Middle school, uh, high school, about eight, ninth graders. 
And um, I was teaching them Arabic. And it was very easy to teach them Arabic because they, they were very well mannered. They were very, were very well mannered before they came to me. I didn't have to hit them or anything like that. Of course, they had to learn the hard way. They had to learn from Mr. Stick. Right? But then I came to America. And I tried to teach them the same way. Those guys, six months, I taught them how to speak Arabic. And they were able to translate a chef that came from Saudi Arabia. And they translated for him. Every word, I, give, I would give them something like 50 words a day. They would memorize every word. 50 words a day. For six months, every single day, 50 words, that's, that's a lot of vocabulary, especially, uh, you know, especially when you have, they, they really memorize it and you're speaking in Arabic all the time. So, I came to America and I wanted to replicate, duplicate that. Same thing. But every time I turned around, Ustad, somebody hit me with a spit rod. Ustad, somebody poked me with a pencil. I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Two weeks, and we have, we have only covered two pages, 24 words! <laughs> I used to get 50 words a day! Two weeks, you got 24 words! Where are we going? It, I felt like pushing a ship, or a boat, or <laughs> on sand. <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere! It doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> And so, I'm teaching Arabic, and I said, forget this. I'm not going to teach Arabic until these guys know what to, um, until these guys have manners, because I found out that, you know, they're lacking in manners. But how do you teach children manners, right? By the way, if you want to teach your children, the first thing you should teach them is manners. Teach them to be obedient to you, and then you can teach them anything you want after that. If you haven't taught them to be obedient to you, then you will never get anywhere. You're just pushing that same ship that I was trying to push in the sand. Right? Teach them manners first. And you will see if you read this, the, the biographies of the great scholars of the past, that's what they started off with. So, anyways, I started to teach them. I said, forget Arabic, you guys. It's story time. And we're like, yeah, the story. And you know, Islamic school? <laughs> oh, Islamic school. Uh, you get the worst students and the best students. You get students whom parents are very concerned about their children, so they bring them, and they are very, they've been very careful with their children for, from, from, from the beginning. That's why they're sending them to Islamic schools. And then you have students that the public schools can't even handle them. They rejected them. So these are public school rejects, which is equal to criminals. <laughs> No, I'm not even joking. These are like criminals. You know, I mean, not poor and poor criminals. Criminals without the quotes. You know, do you understand? These are criminals. So you have criminals and you have, mashallah, poor and poor angels, okay? And you have, mashallah. So how do you teach these guys? Everybody loves stories. So for two whole months, the only thing I did was teach them. I gave them stories of prophets, the scholars. For two months, every single day, they would come in. Oh, it's story time! And they're really happy. They're waiting for my class. Because they know it's story time. We just sit there and enjoy entertainment. Islamic school style. Right? And so that's... So they're getting all of this, all of these stories. After two months, we start Arabic again. And then somebody does not behave, he doesn't sit properly, I say. Do you know how Imam Ahmad used to sit in his house? Tell me something about Imam Ahmad. And so one of them would say, Imam Ahmad, dude, that dude was cool. He used to memorize Alf, Alf Hadith, a billion Hadith, like we memorize Qul Allah Ahad. Yes, that's the guy. I want you to tell, how did he say? Can you, do you remember anything? So he's like, yeah, I do. He said, I felt uncomfortable stretching my legs 
towards the direction of my teacher. Who is his teacher? Imam Shafi. That's another cool dude. <laughs> Imam Shafi. I felt uncomfortable. And he lived three blocks away. So I said, if Imam Ahmed were here, would he be sitting like you? No, he wouldn't. Yeah. I love you, Muhammad, man. That's cool, too. So they have an example now. And he sits up. And when he turns a page like this, you know, I come to I look at him and I say, Ahmed, do you remember how Imam Shafi used to turn the pages of his notes and books? Do you remember anything? I said, yeah, Imam Shafi, that's another cool dude. Right? All these guys are cool. And so he said, yeah. He used to sit in, in, in the halaqa of Imam Malik. And he would say, I would be so careful in turning the pages that I would, be, I would make sure it would not make any noise. Okay, Imam Shafi, if he were here, would he turn the books, pages like that? No, 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 no. I never had to tell, don't turn the pages like this. Don't do this, don't do that. Do it like, no. They always had an example to go back to. In sitting, in talking, in respecting parents, in respecting the teacher, in working hard. They had an example. I just had to mention, just like right now, if I told, if I mentioned something, you guys, how do you duck? What's the best duck that you can do? They say, you do the Jordan tugly. <laughs> right? That's what they would say. They would know that. And then they would be in the, in the basketball court and pretend to do it. Why? They like Mike. Everybody wants to be like Mike. But how about Abu Huraira? Abu Huraira. Oh, no. I'm not Abu Huraira. Do you know who Abu Huraira was? And they would say he was a cool guy. So every single day, before you start to teach anything, you have to teach manners. After you teach manners, then everything else comes easier. So, how do you do it though? How do you do it? Stories. They can't complain. Everyone likes stories. In fact, if you do it so often, they will look forward to it. And you will learn. Because you have to learn these stories yourself. Right? What are you going to have to tell? So you are improving yourself while at the same time you're helping your children. And then you have a peaceful house to tell them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit from what he's taught us to teach us that was benefits. Jazakumma khayr wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.